Let's start by taking a look at the reasons for failure in acquisition deals. And the question I want you to have in the back of your mind while we talk about this is, are we talking about cause or are we talking about effect? If you Google, why do acquisitions fail? You'll get a long list of uh, factors which explain where a very, very long list of deals went wrong. Um, and this tells you what went wrong, but importantly, it doesn't tell you why it went wrong. And you'll see what I mean when we get to the end of this lecture. So I do think it's informative when we start our discussion about why acquisitions fail, that we should review these factors, if only to realise that it's a starting point and not an ending. The Harvard Business Review can be quoted as saying that between 70% and 90% of all deals fail. And by that, I mean they, uh, the acquired company makes lower profits uh, following acquisition than it did before, uh, or indeed uh, the synergies are unable to be um, uh, reflected, be, be, be obtained. The Boston Consulting Group estimates that between 50 and 60% of all deals destroy value. And it's interesting that uh, more than half acquired firms end up being divested. So this is a real recipe, a real um, transaction history, if you like, of uh, utter disaster. If we look at some of the factors, let's start with poor strategic fit. And I'm going to try and give you examples as we go along so that you'll get a, an idea. And if you want to investigate these more uh, in more detail to understand them better, you can do so. So essentially, poor strategic fit means there is an inability to realise the benefits of the deal. So they're sort of two ships meeting in the night, but they pass each other and they miss. Uh, eBay's acquisition of Skype in 2005 is a good example of this. Uh, eBay hoped to take advantage of Skype's peer-to-peer -peer technology, although with hindsight, it was unclear what eBay was going to do with the peer-to-peer -to -peer technology and indeed what it was doing in a communications business at all. It subsequently divested eBay. Uh, it subsequently divested Skype. If you look at synergies or the lack of synergies, or indeed the overestimation of the complexities of delivery of those synergies, then the AOL Time Warner deal is an excellent example. So um, uh, the idea was to combine um, technically, uh, AOL acquired Time Warner. In fact, the that was the the, um, the effect of the merger. Although in, in in control terms, Time Warner acquired AOL. Uh, they acquired it in 2000, and it was spun off in 2009. The original idea was to combine Time Warner's media empire with AOL's 30 million subscribers, and hey, you were going to have this amazing media company, and wouldn't everything be brilliant? But nobody actually worked out what to do after the deal closed. So the two companies remained operationally separate. The two management teams could never agree on any joint consumer offerings as neither wanted to surrender revenue to the other. The whole thing uh, did not work. When you look at cultural misfits, um, they we're talking here about uh, fundamental incompatibilities uh, combined with the buyer attempting to replace positive aspects of the target's culture in the name of uniformity. Now, a good example here is the Daimler-Benz acquisition of Chrysler in 1998. And this is a fundamental mismatch of German culture and American work practices, essentially formality versus informality. Now, having worked uh, for eight years for Westdeutsche Landesbank, I completely understand uh, German culture. In fact, I was brought up uh, living quite a lot of my uh, youth in Germany because my father was in the army. In addition to this, I've also worked for S.G. Cowan, and Cowan was um, Sockgen's um, uh, U.S. Technology Investment Bank, and that was very much a U.S. cultural-style organisation. And in fact, to add insult to injury, the cultural uh, clashes within that organisation, where you had um, uh, French, Brits and Americans all trying to work together, uh, really was a complete nightmare. So culture is a critical issue, and uh, when it doesn't work, it's, it makes the it makes it a very uncomfortable place to have to exist in. Uh, leadership, or weak leadership, or lack of leadership, uh, you know, can lead to things like loss of key talent, uh, or where leadership doesn't participate sufficiently in the deal. And the Sprint acquisition of Nextel in two thousand and five here is a good example. 
The idea of Sprint and Nextel was to combine home communication services of Sprint with the business infrastructure services of Nextel. But soon after the merger, um, there was no real um, drive or integration and Nextel executives left in droves, citing incompatible cultures, but in fact it was lack of leadership. Transaction parameters. This can be quite a broad one. Essentially, it's either overpayment or inappropriate deal structures. And if you look at the Quaker Oats acquisition of Snapple in uh, 1994, uh, Quaker Oats paid $1.7 billion for a company that was turning over, uh, had revenues at that time of, of $700 million. Uh, When they sold it 27 months later, it had revenues of $500 million. Uh, and they sold it uh, for $300 million. So that's a net $1.4 billion of value destruction uh, in 27 months. Pretty good going if you were trying to achieve it. Uh, Quaker thought it could leverage its relationships with larger supermarkets and dis distributors, but in fact, more than half of Snapple's sales came from small channels. The whole two things didn't uh, work at all. Uh, essentially, though, um, uh, Quaker Oats paid a vast amount of money uh, for the wrong deal and um, suffered the consequences uh, 27 months later when it sold it. A lack of uh, due diligence, insufficient investigation, whether it's strategic or operational, uh, can be catastrophic. And, and the much cited example here uh, is Bank of America's acquisition of Countrywide in, note the date, January 2008, where they paid $40 billion. This is classically the wrong acquisition at the wrong time. Bank of America was very keen to ex expand its mortgage business uh, and Countrywide had grown very rapidly, but significantly it had grown rapidly by expanding its subprime business. And um, any student of financial history will appreciate that uh, the 2008 was the year of the subprime financial meltdown. So the focus on size rather than shareholder returns um, led to them rushing through the deal, even in the evidence that Countrywide was being sued in various jurisdictions for its mortgage practices. Um, but they didn't really get to review or spend time reviewing Countrywide's book of mortgages until after the deal. And since then, they've spent another $40 billion, uh, settling Countrywide-related claims. So the wrong deal uh, at the wrong time, exacerbated by the lack of due diligence. When it comes to communications, the importance of communications in a deal is critical. And um, we're back to Bank of America again. I'm sorry, this is not a Bank of America uh, slating exercise. They just seem to be coming up with all the, the right examples. Uh, in 2008, they merged with Merrill Lynch at the height of the turmoil. But months after the deal, the two companies had still not decided which executives would run key parts of the business. And having worked in a number of investment banks, I know how uh, a many when you put lots of A-type personalities together determined to defend their own patch, regardless of the consequences for the organisation, the dis result can be disaster if you don't have somebody communicating what we're trying to achieve. Uh, as a result, many key Merrill bankers left and that really essentially destroyed the rationale for the deal because a lot of these uh, key bankers were rainmakers and where the, a lot of the revenue and profitability came from. So, of course, with hindsight as well, um, the timing of this deal as the subprime crisis broke uh, wasn't terribly good either, although arguably it was a defensive response to that crisis. Um, key talent... Um, uh, losing key talent um, can be a, um, uh, a key, a major problem as well, where you fail to identify key personnel. And I've just actually talked about it. Sorry, the hat trick for Bank of America when they merged with Merrill Lynch. And I've just explained what happened. They didn't identify key roles and people left as a result. Uh, so all in all, one can say uh, with a um, uh, little chance of contradiction that Bank of America didn't have a good run in 2008 and 2009. Now, the, the um, technology can be a significant problem. Um, and uh, if you don't identify uh, the fundamental incompatibilities or you underestimate the time it requires to integrate systems, it can be very problematic. Uh, Facebook's uh, acquisition of Instagram in 2012 is quite a good example of this. In many, as in many um, respects, uh, Instagram and Facebook still operate um, completely separately 
because they can't integrate their systems terribly well, although there has been some photo sharing between photo sharing integration between the two platforms. Uh, of course, the Instagram acquisition was largely a defensive deal to prevent Instagram being uh, acquired by Twitter. So they weren't really worried about the, um, the technology. They just wanted to stop Twitter getting the company. The main justifications uh, on acquisition therefore centre on either being a better provider of growth capital, and we haven't heard much about that at all yet, uh, providing better management, and there seems to be little evidence of that, or indeed the mutual transfer or sharing of valuable skills and assets, i.e. synergies. And so far it seems to be harder rather than easier to do that as well. So we've looked at then the reasons for failure, and I have given you these various reasons. And the, the issue that I keep on coming back to is that these are um, lots of effects where deals have gone wrong, but they don't actually answer the question, you know, why do these acquisitions fail? So we're still looking for the cause of this, and we're going to explore that a little bit more in the next lecture.